Welcome back, everyone, for another deep dive. Today, we're going to be uh, really digging into this. Uh, it's called OCEL 2.0. And no, it's not some new gadget or anything like that. OCEL stands for Object Centric Event Log. Mm. And it's pretty amazing stuff. We're talking about really getting down to the nitty gritty of how things really work. Think like Imagine being able to pinpoint the exact hiccup in a supply chain or finally cracking the code on customer behavior. That's the kind of power we're talking about. Powerful stuff. Yeah. And, you know, we always like to have a guide for these deep dives. And today we're going off of this new academic paper. It's called the OCL, Object Centric Event Log 2.0 Specification. Now, I know specification might not sound like the most exciting thing in the world, but trust me on this. It's important. This one. Yeah, this is a big deal. This paper is basically setting the standard, right? It's like laying down the ground rules for how we talk about this whole object-centric event data thing. Which is crucial. I mean, you can imagine when everyone's on the same page, sharing info, building on each other's work, it's just... Well, it's night and day, really. Yeah, exactly. No more like trying to decipher some secret code. <laughs> so, okay, what makes this OCEL 2.0 so different? Like, what can it do that traditional process mining just can't handle? Yeah, so think about ordering something online, right? It's not just, boom, click, package appears, right? There's a whole journey the product takes, the customer experience, payments, deliveries, the whole web of things happening. But traditional process mining kind of tries to measure all that with a ruler, if that makes sense. It's limiting, for sure. Yeah, it misses out on all those connections, the things that make it interesting. And this is where this object-centric approach really shines, is OCL 2.0. It's not just about those individual cases, like a single order. We're talking about the objects themselves, the products, customers, payments, all of them. How they all work together change over time. The paper uses the example of a procurement process. You've got your purchase requisitions, your invoices, payments, all that. Each one's got its own little story. And with OSTEL 2.0, we can see them all, all those stories, how they're connected. It's really fascinating. Okay, I'm hooked. But let's break it down a bit. Yeah. What are the pieces of this OSEL 2.0 puzzle? The paper does a really good job of explaining it all, like step by step. So first up, we've got events. These are basically actions, stuff that happens like order place, payment process, that sort of thing. Makes sense, right? Then we've got objects. This is where it gets really interesting. So these are the, I guess you could say, the stars of the show, the customer, the product, the actual invoice, and so on. But here's where it clicks, right? We've also got these things called event to object relationships and object to object relationships. So it's not just seeing what happens, but also how it's all connected. Even when there isn't an event, an action taking place, it's like imagine a social network, but for your data. It's really a network when you think about it. Right. You see who's connected to who, what's influencing what. And those relationships, they're key. That's how OCEL 2.0 captures all those details, the things other methods miss. Say there's a holdup somewhere, a delay in materials arriving. Well, with OCEL 2.0, we can track that delay's impact, how it affects the production orders, delivery times, even customer satisfaction down the line. It's all connected. So we're not just seeing a single snapshot. It's like the whole movie from beginning to end. This is cool. Okay. The paper gives this example about a purchase order and how the quantity of something changes. You know, in the past, you'd only see the final number. But this, this is different. You can see every single change, how the quantity, the price, even the status, how all that evolved over time. Complete history. Yeah, like a time machine for data. This is amazing for really understanding not just what happened, but when and how that affected everything else. It's about understanding the process, how it actually unfolds. I love it. Okay, this is a lot, but it's amazing, you know. How do we actually handle all this information, though? It seems like a lot to manage. That's the cool part. OCEL 2.0 isn't just some idea, you know? The paper goes into how we can use this, how developers have made it a reality. We've got different options, tools that are already out there to really bring this object-centric data to life. It's like choosing the right tool for the job. You wouldn't use a hammer for everything, right? Exactly. Different tools for different tasks. And that's really important for getting everyone on board, making sure this is something everyone can use. I like it. So what's the first tool in the OSTAL 2.0 toolbox? So spill the beans. What's the first tool we're talking about? One of the ways they've brought OCEL 2.0 to life is with, get this, relational databases. Databases, okay. <laughs> <laughs> like the ones that power, like, everything yeah. these days. Exactly. Think of them like, you know, those super organized spreadsheets. Okay, yeah. That's basically what we're talking about. Got it. But how do we go from these, like, dynamic objects and relationships and stuff to rows and columns in a database? It doesn't seem like a natural fit. Right, and that's where OCL 2.0 gets clever. Instead of cramming everything into one giant table, it splits things up. 
You've got separate tables for each event type and each object type. Everything's organized, easy to find. Oh, okay. So instead of one massive jumbled library, we've got different sections, fiction, history, all that. It's all categorized. Precisely. And just like in a library, this makes finding what you need so much easier. You want to analyze all those order shift events. You just go to that section. Boom, yeah. straight to the order shift table. Need insights on customer behavior, customer tables, where it's at. It's so smart. I love it. And this way, if something new pops up, a new event or a new type of object, you don't have to redo the whole thing, right? Exactly. Just add a new table. Easy peasy. Oh, that's nice. It's like adding a room to your house instead of rebuilding the whole thing. Exactly. And speaking of building things, remember how we were talking about tracking those object attributes as they change over time? Oh, yeah. The time machine stuff. Right. Well, this is where it gets really interesting with the database setup. Okay. I'm listening. Are we talking like endless versions of the same row or something? How does that work? Okay, so each object type table, it's got a secret weapon, a timestamp column. Ooh, timestamp. I like the sound of that. It's like a date stamp on a document. It tells huh. you exactly when something changed. Got it. So each row, it's showing us the object at a specific point in time. Precisely. It's a snapshot in time. So if I wanted to see the journey of, say, a product from start to finish, I could just follow those timestamps. Exactly. It's like a breadcrumb trail or, like you said, a time machine. You can rewind, fast forward, see how things evolved. It's brilliant. They've managed to capture all that movement, all that change within a database. That's really impressive. This is why I love these deep dives. Okay, so we've got databases covered, but... You hinted at other ways to use OCEL 2.0, right? It's not just databases. Oh, absolutely not. Yeah. The creators of OCEL 2.0, they knew they had to cater to different needs, right? Different folks like different things. Options are always good. So what else is there? What other formats can we use with OCEL 2.0? So get this. OCEL 2.0 can also be represented using, wait for it, XML. XML. You're kidding. That's like taking a trip down memory lane back to the early days of the internet. But why XML? I mean, we've got all these new fancy data formats now, right? Yeah, but XML, it's like that old reliable tool, you know? It's still everywhere, especially when it comes to systems talking to each other, sharing data. And that's a big part of what OCEL 2.0 was all about, making sure everyone can use this no matter what system they're on. Right, breaking down those data silos. So it's like another passport stamp for OCEL 2.0, letting it travel across all these different data landscapes. I like that. But they didn't just dust off the old XML playbook, right? They had to make some upgrades to handle this whole object-centric thing. Oh, absolutely. They gave it a serious makeover. The way OCEL 2.0 uses XML, it's way more user-friendly, easier to wrap your head around. Plus, it's built to handle all that good stuff we talked about, those object relationships, those attribute changes over time, all of it. Very cool. So whether you're a database fan or an XML aficionado, OCEL 2.0 has got you covered. But hold on, we can't forget about the reigning champ of data formats, right? JSON. I have a feeling OCEL 2.0 speaks that language too, doesn't it? You know it. It wouldn't be complete without JSON, the language of the web. They've got a whole JSON specification ready to go, so you can use OCEL 2.0 in web apps, visualizations, you name it. It's official. OCEL 2.0 is a true polyglot. Databases, XML, JSON, it can do it all. But, you know, we have to go back to something you said earlier, this whole stepping stone idea. It's like OCEL 2.0 isn't just a new way to organize data. It's a whole new way of thinking about processes. It really is. This is just the beginning. The paper even talks about like having standardized object and event types for different industries. Now that's what I'm talking about, standardized types. That would be huge. What would that look like, say, in manufacturing? Can you give me an example? Okay, so imagine every company, everyone making stuff, all using the same set of object types for, you know, the things they work with, materials, products, machines, all of it. And the same event types too, right? Like order received, production started, all those common actions. Exactly. We'd have a shared language, a universal dictionary for the entire industry. <laughs> Which means no more guesswork. We could finally compare apples to apples. Imagine the insights we could get if we could benchmark processes, see what works best across entire industries. It would be a game changer, absolutely. Supply chain, risk management, even regulatory stuff. Everything could be improved. This is incredible. And the paper even touched on using AI with all this. AI trained on all that standardized data. The possibilities are endless. It's true. The potential is enormous. We could have AI analyzing processes, finding patterns we never even thought of, optimizing everything. My mind is officially blown. 
This and speaking of the future, listeners, if you want to learn more about this OCL 2.0, we'll have a link to the website in the show notes. It's got tons of info, examples, tools, all sorts of good stuff. And here's something to think about. What process in your own life, maybe at work, maybe just your daily routine, could you look at in a whole new way with this object-centric thinking? It's pretty amazing stuff. Until next time, everyone, keep exploring and keep on learning. Thank you.